Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Simmons, the president of Astronomers Without Borders, and this is our monthly hangout for August. We have a lot of interesting things to talk about today. We're going to have uh, Kathleen Horner, who is the astro crafts person in the astro arts program that we have, and she has some very interesting things that she's going to share. For those of you who haven't seen them yet, we'll show you where to go on the blog in order to see them. We have a new uh, program that we're going to talk about that hasn't been quite made public yet, but so this is the public debut with uh, Leo Highland, who's the program manager for a new global club pairing program. And that program is really very exciting because it's Astronomers Without Borders uh, essence, bringing uh, groups together. And we also have a guest with us from one of the countries, uh, Pakistan, who will be involved in that as well. And then uh, Andrew Fazekas, our communica communications manager, and I will be talking about a few things. A new program from Uwingo called Beam Me to Mars, in which you can send messages and even images to Mars with a lot of luminaries who are already doing this. And we'll, we'll talk about that, as well as an update on telescopes to Tanzania, which I hope everybody has heard about and uh, spread the word about. We're in our last nine days of that campaign now. And we want to make sure everyone helps with this final push. And I'd like to bring Andrew in now to talk about that, because that's really primary that we need everybody involved with just over a week to go. So welcome, Andrew. Hi, Mike. So uh, we had a big promotion for, uh, for, for telescopes to Tanzania in our Indiegogo campaign uh, just recently, and I think it got a lot of attention. Tell us about that. That's right. We, uh, we, we basically decided we're halfway through our campaign now, uh, which was a 60-day campaign, uh, and uh, we thought, you know, uh, we're going to try something new uh, in terms of driving some donations, and boy, was it a success. And uh, we called it $1 Donation Day. It ran on Friday, August 15th. And, uh, you know, we're all concerned eh, about how exactly it would turn out, but it really was a, an amazing success. Uh, we basically doubled our donations uh, over a course of just uh, a few days, actually. It, it, we thought it would just last on a Friday in terms of when we put the call out for just asking for a dollar uh, or, you know, if, or more if people uh, were willing to donate. And, boy, people just really came, came to the call, and we were so, just really impressed with the donations. They ranged everywhere from a dollar to all the way up to $1,000. And uh, so we're now standing really close, uh, uh, about fifteen and a half thousand dollars out of our thirty-eight thousand dollar goal, and we have uh, just under uh, ten days now left in the campaign. And so uh, we're really crossing our fingers uh, that the you know folks are going to check the, the the Indiegogo site out that we have up for telescopes to Tanzania and see what the wonderful work uh, is being done there in bringing education, science education, to children there and in, in one of the most wonderful, exquisite ways that we, you could ever think of. Mm -hmm. so, it, so we're almost halfway there, but we have very little time left. Uh, now, the thing is, we know that with these crowdfunding campaigns, the last week is absolutely crucial, and sometimes they really take off. And we had a lot of media people, bloggers and mainstream media, who helped us spread the word this last time with the Dollar Day donation. And we'll be reaching out to them again, uh, and, and hopefully everybody will help spread the word. I mean, it's donating is one thing, but it, this depends on the number of people. So the more people we can get involved, the better. So spreading the word, sharing with friends. Exactly. Really exactly, Mike. Sharing is a big, big key here, is that uh, what we'd like to see is folks sharing the, the, the message here, sharing this, the, 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 the wonderful work that Telescopes to Tanzania is offering. So, so we're asking people not just to donate, but also pass the word around through their social networks, it, be it Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you're using, even old-fashioned email, just sending it out to, to people in your contact list, and just letting people know that, that you, know, you have supported it, and you, uh, you know, you're encouraging others in, in, your, in your circle of friends and family to, to join us in, in, in this wonderful campaign. 
Uh, okay, thanks. And uh, so let's. Uh, uh, what what are the what are the plans? I mean, is there anything special we have planned during the during the last week? Well, right now, if people actually go onto our Twitter or Facebook accounts here at AWB, you might notice that there's a nice, wonderful series of photographs that we have with a count, an official countdown of uh, of the uh, of the campaign in the last uh, week or so that we have left, and so we're really probably uh, we're we're trying to get the word out to as many people. So if you can share that, that'd be great. And we're also working on something special. Maybe if we, uh, Mike, if you would allow me, maybe a, a, a contest of sorts in the mm -hmm. last few days that we're going to be doing. And we're pushing it out to uh, our our friends in the, in journalists and bloggers that have helped share the word as well. So in the last few days, we're going to ramp up our activity, and you'll see a lot more information coming out about this uh, telescopes to Tanzania campaign as we come to a close in early September. So. Um, uh, so just I encourage people to do look at our social media and website as well for the latest news. And I, I want to make a, <clears throat> a point here that sometimes misunderstood, which I'm talking over my slide here, but uh, there. And, uh, and that is, this isn't just a matter of taking telescopes and taking them over there. This is building a science center in the sense of a center, a place where education, science education is developed. There are curriculum workshops that are building a curriculum. There are teacher workshops that are showing them the way to teach hands-on inquiry-based learning. These are things that are different than the way, way it's actually taught there. And this is all self-sustaining and it is run by the people in the country. We're advising, we're helping. But but this is a real game changer. This is not to get telescopes into the hands of a few fortunate uh, schools or children. This is to bring a new uh, idea, new ideas about science education, and really build the science education curriculum in the country. Yeah, and definitely, and you know, astronomy is just such a wonderful way to do it. It's a natural fit. You know, um, you could see it actually in some of the images that uh, we have from some of the initial work that's already been done uh, with the children there, uh, and you can see the eagerness, the the desire to learn, and really. Astronomy is just a wonderful pathway into into the world of science of and, uh, and science education, um, and so uh, it's a, just a natural fit. It works so well. We've had so much success already. So it's it's an ex it's so exciting to know that there's just we're close to the end of the campaign, and we just need that those donations so that we can bring it to life to get to the next phase of actually making this a reality. Yeah, and, and I think uh, you really hit on the key, and I've sort of made it a mission. My background is not education, and we have partners for this, but you know, when, after seeing how astronomy works so well to introduce science to places that have not had the ability to do it with the natural laboratory above us in the sky, it needs very little. Uh, it's a gateway to other sciences, so uh, it, it's become clear to me that this is the way to promote science education through astronomy. We're not the first to think of this, of course, but I will be uh, at a meeting seeing some of our partners, Galileo Teacher Training Program, Universe Awareness, uh, all about astronomy education. This is not about teaching astronomy. This is about introducing science, hands-on science, as a way to get people started. In science yeah. and teaching. And AWB is perfect to do this because we've got our, our, uh, our network, global network mm -hmm. here at play. And you know, it, 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 places like in Tanzania, the skies are just so much more pristine, aren't they? I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to, to be in Africa myself and, and travel there. And it's just, that's one of the things that you, know, you notice at night. It's just the stars are out there and it's just amazing. And it's a perfect place to. I'm I'm sure that the children there, the kids there at the school, they they would have much better skies than I would have here in Montreal, Canada. I tell you that. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and that's the thing is that there are resources available. That's one of the natural resources. The enthusiasm of the teachers and the students is tremendous. We bring in other resources and fill in where things are missing, and suddenly we have a great. A great program. So this is a real game changer, and I, I think it can make a big difference, not just in Tanzania, but throughout East Africa. 
Uh, and, uh, and, I, and you know what, Mike? I, I encourage people to visit our Indiegogo uh, site, uh, Telescope Tensi, and look at the updates. We've got letters there from teachers, from educators there on site, saying what uh, you know what this program has already brought to them and what their hopes are uh, for the future. So you can see the excitement right there on the ground. So I encourage people to visit and read those updates, those little diaries that we're, we're running on uh, every other day there. It's worth, worth a read. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, probably we have the slide up now showing a picture from Tanzania along with the URL for the Indiegogo campaign. And uh, it, it's it, you have to be convinced by this. Uh, there, there are people uh, there who are saying this really is making a big difference, uh, sort of turning things around. So we want everybody to support this. It's not just about astronomy. It's not even just about science. It's about education. And we can do so much with very little because the campaign we're doing there for $38,000, if it was here, it would cost $300,000 to do the same thing. It's easy. Um, so uh, we hope everyone will support us there. Well, thank you, Andrew, for joining us for that. My Don't pleasure. go away. We'll be talking again soon about another program uh, towards the, the end of the program here. <clears throat> but I'd like to introduce now Kathleen Horner, who is the ast Astro Crafts person. Uh, Kathleen was a perfect fit for the Astro Arts program that was begun by Daniela DePaulis and uh, what Kathleen does is is really terrific. Uh, talk about hands-on. This is not uh, professional artists doing things that we all enjoy. This is about doing things yourself. So welcome, Kathleen. And you're muted, so check your microphone. There you go. Oops, Mike. No. Yeah, oh. there we are. Yeah, on. <laughs> uh huh. You're you're on. This, these are things that oh. happen with these live programs okay. sometimes. Okay. All right. Um, yes, I'm happy to be here, and I wanted to thank you, Mike, and I also wanted to thank Daniela DePaulis for inviting me to get involved in the Astrocrafts program. Um, being an artist um, and loving astronomy, this has just been custom design for me. So I really had a lot of fun doing this and it's been very rewarding. I also want to give a special nod to Daniela for coming up with the idea. I think it's, it's something that's really a lot of um, fun for everybody. Well it seemed to me, Kathleen, that you were doing all these astrocrafts and you were posting them on uh, on Facebook and so on and Daniela just said, hey, we need to have this as part of the program. So I think you are already the AstroCrafts person. I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, show us some but, of the things that you've done because there are some okay. that are very timely too. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to start with what's really unique about AstroCrafts and that it's kind of um, a little primer on astronomy, science, and facts. And um, it also includes brief history on the subject of the project and directions on how to create it. So there's a lot going on there. Plus I include resources and links on there. So there's a little bit of everything in there for everyone to learn. Sort of hands-on um, astronomy lesson and yeah. arts included in that. Okay, um, let's see. We have the Rosetta Mission. We all know what's happening there. Uh, the probe, the Rosetta probe, has reached the comet, and this coming November, we know that the lander is going to be deployed and touch down on the surface, and that's going to be fun. I'm really excited about that. Um, interesting note on this is that between the probe and the lander, there's going to be two full laboratories and 21 instruments. That's a lot of testing, a lot of research. And if you think about it, we are actually going to be, or literally, riding um, a comet around the sun while observing its activities for the first time in the history of science, or for that fact, the world, really. I mean, this is an incredible thing that's, that's happening. And Absolutely. so I got really excited about that. And of course, being an artist and a photographer, I um, 
really got excited about the images and noticed how beautiful the comet looked in uh, deep space, so I got the idea of using a black background. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details on how it's made because that is um, in the Astrocraft's article, detailed materials and how to make it, but um, it's very easy and I used a mixture of flour and water for a pliable dough and um, it's easily um, done by anyone, children, you know, this, this is really a project that's for everybody. In fact, all of the mm -hmm. astronauts. Well, this is something uh, it, it first strikes me as something that uh, teachers might do with their classes to sort of uh, bring uh, the Rosetta mission and the comet uh, down to earth, so to speak, and uh, get the kids excited about what it is that's going on. Uh, this is actually, it's pretty, uh, you know, the picture shows it is, is pretty neat. I guess you could go into as much detail as you wanted to to try and actually uh, uh, recreate it. But uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was surprised when I saw this. It's, you yeah. know, if you looked at a distance, you'd think, well, okay, that's the comet. But it's, yeah. it's flower. Yeah, it really is. So I hope I'll be hearing from some people on that one. Um, anyway... We're going to move on to Jupiter and the Moon's Mobile. This was really kind of neat to see that hanging up from the ceiling um, because it's, you know, the little moons kind of move around and you sort of get the effect of little moons in orbit around Jupiter. But um, I had to choose before I started this. I thought, well, there's 63 moons that orbit Jupiter, so I can't very well get 63 going there. Right. And okay. seem to have frozen up here somehow. So um, I don't. This is this happens with. Oh, it looks like we lost Kathleen. I wasn't sure who is frozen where, <clears throat> but we just uh, dropped her off there. Let's see if she comes back quickly. This happens with the uh, with the Google Hangouts once in a while. Somebody drops out, and uh, it, with live programs, there's not too much you can do about that. So. Um, let me, um, okay, well, don't see her coming back right away. So we have several other things that, Kath, whoops, is Kathleen back now? Thought I saw her, now I don't. Give her just a second and uh, if she doesn't come back in, we'll... Uh, we'll move on. Okay, we can come back to Kathleen then when we get the connection reestablished with her. This reminds me of the early days of uh, news programs when we had live uh, interviews with people and remotes were always dropping out. So, so we, we're not doing this over satellite here, so things happen. <clears throat> so until we get Kathleen uh, back in here, let's, uh, let's move on. I want to want to bring in um, Leo Hyland, who's the manager of the new program. For um, well, and before we, Leo, I see you're there. And before we start talking about that, let me just uh, mention that the Astrocrafts program has got a, a lot of different uh, projects like that, as well as what Kathleen mentioned with the um, with the the introduction. And these are all in blog style, part of the AstroArts blog. And when the program is over on the YouTube channel, we will have the URL where you can find that. If you <clears throat> want to uh, look for your own, we realize we don't have a direct link to it on the on the uh, website itself. One of the corrections we have to make, but you can uh, go to the projects and under Astro Arts if you look at the Astro Arts blog and then filter for the uh, for the Astro Crafts, you'll see it there. But we'll have the link available immediately after this uh, program is over on the YouTube channel where we are. So, Leo, 
Welcome to you. Uh, a little bit quicker than we thought, but uh, you are running what is really an exciting program. This goes back to the beginning of Astronomers Without Borders and what I had really planned on doing all along, was, which was having clubs talking to each other without borders based on our sharing the same sky and uh, all doing the same thing. And the technology has come a long way since then, so we can do this a lot easier. So. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Global uh, Pairing Program and, and who's taking part and what's happening. Okay, Mike. Uh, very good. Uh, give you a little background on how I got involved, too. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to mention that I retired from Intel Corporation this year, and as part of the program uh, that Intel had uh, developed, they wanted to encourage uh, teaching science and astronomy to younger children. And uh, <clears throat> so I got involved in that. and. Uh, met you, Mike, at uh, the expo down in uh, Tucson and uh, wanted to know if there was any way I could help, and you said certainly, and you were excited about it, and yeah. uh, kind of developed this program. So thanks to you for thinking about the, the whole process and, uh, and getting me involved. Uh, so basically, we uh, wanted, we, we, you recognized and, and uh, wanted to uh, utilize the uh, North American clubs uh, with their many, many members, and most of those members uh, are uh, elderly people, I'll say, like me, uh, older people that with a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, maturity in science and electronics and, uh, and uh, uh, astronomy. So we decided that we would like to utilize those club members to perhaps uh, uh, go out and reach out to other worldwide clubs and uh, meet with them and to learn about their cultures and uh, maybe exchange ideas. And Catherine's back. If you want to pick up Catherine real quick. I well, am so sorry. I was playing hide and seek. <laughs> um. <laughs> you did. Well, we, we were talking with Leo. Uh, Kathleen, but I know you have to go. Do you have a few minutes or should we I have, come back? No, I have, I have a few. I, it wasn't that I needed to go that early. I'm okay. sorry about that. Um, well, anyway, uh, let's see. So, Kat, uh, we'll just restart me here in a minute. <laughs> I guess uh, this is one of the things about live programming, but uh, I, I know uh, Kathleen has a little bit of a time crunch. So, Leo, why don't we come back to you? This is sure. a very exciting program. So oh, let's... I'm sorry, Leo. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I'm glad you made it back. <laughs> Okay, all uh, right, let's see. We were uh, discussing Jupiter and the Moon's mobile. And uh, yeah, okay, um, I assume you're looking at the photo? Yes. Okay, great. Um, about that, I had to choose out of 63 moons, of course, I chose the four main IO, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. Um, this is up to the individual person who's wanting to create this project. You know, this project also lends itself well for um, creating other planets and moons or the, if you want to do the entire solar system like I do. In the future one day, that's, uh, I mean, it's really kind of unlimited. This project is based on using paper mache and maybe some of you might remember that back in elementary school. I do it all the time because I'm an artist, but it lends itself well for creating globes and, of course, the planets. And mm -hmm. it's messy, but it's fun. And mm -hmm. there's instructions, of course, in the article telling you exactly how to do this. Um, and the neat thing about paper mache is that it dries well and dries hard, so you've got kind of a permanent sculpture on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Do you have any questions? Well, uh, you know, and we I don't know if we put out uh, to the audience to be able to write questions in, but there is the uh, Q&A app. If anybody does uh, have questions, uh, you can go ahead and pop them in there. We should have mentioned that. Yeah. But uh, nothing, nothing right now. Well, one question asking if this is live. Yes, it is. If you've seen the uh, little glitches we've had, that's an indication of that. So, if there are any other questions, pop them in there. Okay. So, Kathleen, what All other right. sorts of things are there? Okay, we have the constellation jars, and that was really exciting to get involved in. Um, actually, wow. I did three or four different 
kind. You can use a mason jar, um, vase, um, any kind of glass container that has a wide mouth that you can put one of these little round battery powered lead lights down at the bottom so that when you've got your little star sheet created it reflects these really cool star designs on the ceiling and on the wall. It's really kind of neat to sit back in a dark room and look at the little constellation patterns and of course the object of this particular um, astrocraft was to um, study the constellations, get acquainted with the constellations, go outside and bring your friends or with your family, grab a star chart, you can get the star charts online by the way, and sit under the stars and familiarize yourself with the constellations. Um, I think this, this is really something beautiful that we all are fascinated by the night sky. Mm -hmm. and this is especially nice for children. Yeah, this is a very nice looking and it's a great picture of it. And can you give us just basically how the patterns are made here? Is this an insert that's, that you've uh, created the star patterns on that goes inside the jar? Yeah, well you're not going to believe it, but actually an aluminum baking pan, you can use heavy duty tin foil if you want to. I don't think it lasts as long, but it works. But I did the aluminum baking pan bottom. You just cut out a sheet that fits the dimensions of the inside of the uh, vase. In this case, I had a tall cobalt blue vase that I used. And um, you get some star or some constellation patterns online and print those out and study them. And um, take an ice pick and maybe I use a safety pin for the little stars and an ice pick for the main stars of the constellations and you design, you, know, you just choose what constellations you want to use. It's very and nice. Holes in there and yeah, fit yeah. it inside, yeah. Well that's pretty um, simple and the result is really very nice. Uh, yeah. Gee, I may do that one to set out on the railing on our deck here when I have the Quite telescope out. <laughs> it is. It's wonderful. Okay, so the Earth Globe wind sock, that's really wonderful to see blowing in the wind out in the backyard. I have one that's in the background here behind me. I just stuck it up there. By the way, I'm in my photography studio, so no, I don't leave that in front of the door normally, but I hung it up so you all could kind of, you can hang it up inside or you can use it outdoors. Okay, the inspiration behind this was, um, on Earth Day last year, April 22nd, um, I put together an Astrocraft article on Earth Day, included the Earth Day history, um, the worldwide Earth Day activities, and um, a link to the official Earth Day website. And I thought, well, this is a good way to get in touch with our little blue planet and to study the, the terrain. Interesting how challenging that can be when it gets down to painting the globe. And again, the globe was created from paper mache. And, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, that's a, a wonderful experience for anyone. Um, and again, this is a great thing for children, for uh, science teachers. Um, you know, uh, youth organization groups, etc. Of course, my motto with Astrocraft is not just for kids, it's for everybody. We all have a bit of the child in us and the artist and, um, you know, you can pretty much design the globe any way you want as far as using different streamers. Mm -hmm. and all that. But, yeah, mm -hmm. really nice. Well, once uh, Rosetta um, forms, a, I mean, the, the comet that Rosetta is orbiting around forms a bit of a tail. So maybe somebody will uh, add streamers to that for the tail and make a windsock out of that. Oh, yeah. In fact, that was one of the Astrocraft projects, glow-in-the-dark comet, um, which you get this glow-in-the-dark string and put a whole bunch of it for little streamers and then whatever, you know, whatever, other little streamers and ribbons scraps of fabric you want to put together and you go out around dusk and toss it back and forth each other and it actually you can see it you know mm. it's a, it kind mm. of glows in the dark uh, so yeah uh, and you can block that comet 
thoughts on this particular Astrocrafts Article 2. Yeah. Are there uh, any other types of uh, projects that you'd like to mention as well? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, there, did we get the Astrolabe? Um, Haven't yeah, done that. We have the Astrolabe, and I don't think many people are familiar with the Astrolabe. Um, and really, it could be best described as an astronomical computer with a, a history that dates back 200 BC. And so, how does it work? It measures how high above the horizon the sun and the stars are in degrees. And I do use mine. I made a little cardboard, um, cardstock um, astrolabe with a straw and a, a metal washer weight. And I actually use it to calculate the degrees from the horizon while I'm out there taking night sky pictures. Mm -hmm. you know, have to have anything elaborate. In the article, I also include uh, resources and links on how to print out more elaborate uh, cardstock astrolabes um, that might be, you know, a little more challenging. And yeah. some history lessons about the astrolabe. Again, it has a very long history. Fascinating history. Yeah. So this uh, this seems to me like a uh, simple style of sextant that's uh, used for measuring altitudes and it, it really is, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And I think the astrolabe was mainly used for um, earth and sky mm -hmm. degree measurements as opposed to the sextant, which I think is for navigation on waters, right? Yeah, yeah. You, well, navigation anywhere, but, uh, well, you anywhere. know, courses. And uh, that type of instrument is used before uh, the invention of the telescope uh, in very, very large, elaborate sizes to get accurate measurements of the positions of the stars. And they did amazingly well with it. Yes. So this is very instructive. So. Yes, and so that's it. And I'll just rattle off a, a few things um, that um, the Astrocraft projects that I did over the year of 2013. I kind of focused in on the summer solstice season. Um, that was entitled Art and Soul, and it kind of emphasized solar energy, um, sun prints, and solar light lanterns. And then I um, shared the glitter Milky Way galaxy art, which was fun and messy. And I was finding glitter all over the house and all over <laughs> me for <laughs> months to come. Uh, space sun catchers and ornaments during the winter solstice and the holiday season, how to make sundials, a variation of designs, and then the constellation coasters, and then we talked about the glow in the dark comet. So, I mean, who knows what else I'm going to come up with, you know, it's well, really fun, I never really know and, <laughs> until I put my inspiration hat on and um, start doing a little research. Well, it, it seems that there are endless ideas, at least uh, you make it look that way. And you make it look easy, too. And I know some of these uh, might be a little more elaborate, but there are plenty that, that uh, clearly anybody could do. Yeah, they are. They are. And, yeah. I, and I guess this, uh, the web link to the uh, Astrocraft's past projects will be on the YouTube Hangout video and I think somewhere else. I wasn't sure yeah. where. Well, it'll be on the uh, YouTube archived in the comments, <clears throat> not on the video itself, but it will be clickable so people won't have to remember what it is. So as soon as we finish up here, very quickly, they'll, uh, <clears throat> that uh, will be available, and it's in the comments already ready to go. So I don't know if it's visible yet, but it will be when we're done, I'm sure of that. Okay, and before I go, I wanted to thank Andrew for so much for helping me out as far as getting um, social networking and helping me promote it. So thanks a lot, Andrew. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, well, you know, it's, it's delightful to have you as part of Astro Arts. Astro Arts itself, Astro Crafts, and the way that uh, we're able to work with you is kind of an example of a lot of what Astronomers Without Borders does because... We're, we're an umbrella of sorts for many different uh, projects like this and what you do, what people do locally often uh, is fantastic and people doing it in other places but they don't aren't able to get the word out and get more people involved so that's something that I'm always thrilled to be able to do because more people now will see what you're doing 
the Astronauts program itself is a world-class program that Daniela has put together in so many ways. Yes. <laughs> but uh, good projects like this, good programs like this with so many good projects deserve to be seen and shared by many people. And uh, with our community, we're able to do that. So who knows? You know, there could be... Uh, kids in schools making uh, copies of the comet in in uh, Tanzania or Uganda or Brazil or could be anywhere. Yeah, oh Hopefully. I hope so. That would thrill me to no end to know that. that yeah, well we will we'll, we'll uh, we have some changes coming on the website which I, yeah. seems to be a constant theme with us but more capabilities for people to report back and say here's what we're doing. So this would be a fabulous one for that. Well, that's grand, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on the program. Well, thank you for joining us and talking more about it. I hope you get a lot more attention to what it is you're doing. I look forward to new creative uh, ideas. I may not be getting my hands in the paper mache and flour uh, and water dough myself, but <laughs> it's a delight. Oh, I'd like to see you get involved with your hands in paper and <laughs> dough and try it. Well, I've been there. Yeah, done that. When the kids were younger and when my wife was teaching uh, the younger kids, our our house had glitter in it all the time for years. Yes, yes, yes. I <laughs> So maybe I'll get back into it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Mike, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. So good okay. See you all later. Bye-bye. Okay. So, well, let's uh, shift on back to uh, Leo now. Leo, I'm really sorry to have... Uh, had to uh, interrupt you like that. We planned on having Kathleen uh, done uh, early. So you, we were talking about another very exciting program that amateur astronomy clubs can get involved in. And uh, I, we want to hear more about it. So you were uh, talking about how the uh, we have some expertise here in the U.S. and some older clubs, and I'll mention too that uh, maybe uh, you were going to mention this, that clubs, astronomy clubs in other parts of the world are mostly young people, and here in the U.S. it's the older guys like you and me, uh, less diversity than in most, and and, and uh, that's always been a big topic, and another reason for pairing up clubs is to see what is it that's attracting all the young people to clubs in other countries too. Yeah, exactly, Mike. And uh, like you say, there is a number of people here with uh, that are more mature, more experienced, been in the hobby or in science for a very long time, and uh, they uh, they want to share what they uh, know. Uh, so they do outreach programs and what have you, um, and a lot of times locally. But we realize that around the world that there are a number of uh, countries that have very young students that uh, have a a huge desire to uh, to learn about science and astronomy. So we're trying to pair up clubs from North America uh, with the predominance of U.S. clubs, but uh, could also have some Canadian clubs involved <clears throat> to pair up with these countries, uh, clubs in other countries, and then as a result of that, meet, learn about each other, uh, learn about the desires uh, to expand our hobbies or our interest in science and astronomy, and see what we can do from there. We believe that this will start out as an exchange of uh, learning about each other, uh, learning about our cultures, our areas that we live in, what we do each day, and that sort of thing. But we really realize that the club pairing is the conduit to get the people together. After they're together, it's going to be, for the most part, one-on-ones, or it may be groups of people, four or five, six people, uh, talking to each other using uh, Skype or Google Hangouts. Uh, we do believe that it probably will be Skype uh, because Skype is a little easier to, to do in those kind of meetings. And mm -hmm. we, uh, we want to pair them up across the world. And one of the things that we realized when we first got into this is we have a number of challenges that we need to figure out how to overcome. We have time zone differences. We have language differences. And uh, we have to figure out how to, how to get those to, to meet up. And it's, it suddenly became apparent to me that the time zones in some cases are an advantage. Uh, if we talk about Pakistan or India, Sri Lanka, some of the areas in that area that are about 12 hours different uh, from us, this means that we can have someone in our home here in the U.S. Mm. in the evenings, maybe 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the evenings, maybe do some viewing or have a club meeting or have 
just one-on-one -on -one talks or demonstrations about our hobby with students perhaps in classrooms in those areas. So it's a very exciting possibility to, to reach out to young people in other parts of the world. And I just wanted to mention that we do have uh, Maruf from Pakistan on the, um, the uh, Google Hangout here this morning, and he is just starting to pair with the club here in the U.S., and I thought I might ask him what his expectations of the program might be, mm -hmm. if he could give us a few minutes to talk about that. Well, let's uh, 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 we can bring Maruf in. I know there were some technical problems earlier, but uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, we have Maruf here now. And uh, Maruf, I think your microphone is muted, so if you unmute that, we'll be able to hear you. And uh, Maruf, are you able to hear me? Uh, yeah. Ah, there we are. Okay. Now I can hear. Um, and we hear you too, Maruf. And I know. Yeah, we hear. Actually, here we, you know, we are. Uh, everybody has their own equipment, and we get together a monthly basis. We have is some guidance, uh, some um, uh, educational material from uh, you guys so we can present it to school children and um, we uh, actually do have a, a couple of H alpha scopes which we use for sun uh, observation for, for school kids and they're very excited about it because yeah. it's, it's much difficult yeah. to get them uh, out at night and it's much easier for for uh, to visit them their school times. Good. So you so, think uh, you think a demonstration from uh, here in the U.S. or some other location uh, using live telescope viewing and showing that in the classroom would be of great value. Uh, that would be good uh, if we can do it online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be our uh, our objective. If but we the can. problem, uh, the, the normally what the problem there we face is uh, if we go out in the rural areas, there's no internet there. Yeah. So and even if it's there, then the bandwidth is not good enough for that. Well, there are definitely so, going uh, to be a lot of. Yeah, there will be technical challenges, and <clears throat> that's where we're going to have to adapt uh, to whatever is available. Once again, use the resources that are available uh, for that. But I know Leo yeah. has uh, a number of different uh, ideas that will be brought to bear. There. Well, uh, that can be definitely done uh, in the areas where we do have a good internet uh, available. That can be done. Good, good. Well, thanks. So, uh, so do you have any other thoughts on the program and your expectations beyond uh, the classroom? Do you have any other ideas uh, for how we could engage with clubs? Uh, um, well, um, we like to share what other groups are doing and you know, pick up on some ideas. Normally, we here are have some uh, public uh, viewing in the parks and stuff, which is open to general public. Uh, and then uh, we have, we have a school program for children. So, could you uh, could you talk you just know, to any uh, ideas in that regard? Yeah, could you talk for a moment just about how many members you have and where you're uh, where you are located? Uh, the network uh, we are in. You know, uh, you mean where are we based at? Yes, yes. And how many members and where are you located? I'm located in Lahore, uh, Pakistan, which is uh, kind of central or uh, northern uh, Pakistan. It's the second largest city in in, in Pakistan. And, and how many club members do you have in your in your club? How many members? Yes. 
Uh, yeah, we have um, about uh, more than 200 members, but active one are around 20. Oh, okay. Well, so I have to say that the club in Lahore is uh, particularly large and clearly very well equipped uh, amateur astronomy club uh, and very active. Uh, 200 is uh, is very large. Having H alpha telescopes and so on is terrific. Um, having 20 active out of 200 is well, a pretty well, good we ratio. Uh, the, we have uh, very active uh, astrophotography people, and they are doing very nice imaging. Uh, uh, we have a C14 here and some smaller scopes. Very good. Umer uh, is uh, Umer the astrophotographer, one of your members? Yes. Omer Asim is the astro. He, he, he does imaging regularly. Yeah, he's very good. And we, we, have, we have some uh, person um, who is doing narrow band. He has a Takahashi and um, very active in imaging. So we have very active imaging group also, which regularly they put their stuff on a Facebook. Very good. Very good. So thank, thank you, uh, Maruf. And uh, okay, you were going to say yeah. something. We have a big delay. So, so besides uh, the the school program and that, we you know twice or sometime more than twice a year we go out to a dark place for all night observation. And uh, that is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we have some dark areas which are like bottle one or bottle zero, and oh. we can even see zodiacal lights from there. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you for joining us this morning. I know yes, that we thank did. You, Lord. Yeah. I know we did. Yeah. Thank notice. you for joining us. This is a very, uh, very active club, a, a really You're good welcome. club, and I uh, appreciate your bringing us that, so thanks for joining us. Okay, so I think, you can see, I think you can see that uh, there's many uh, uh, good things going on in the program. It's going to grow. Right now we have approximately 15 uh, international clubs that are wanting to pair with North American clubs. And uh, we, we concentrated on trying to engage with the international clubs first. And now we're realizing that we got to push for uh, clubs to join in the U.S. Uh, at this time, we have two or three clubs in the U.S. that are actively involved, but we need to ramp that up. And we're hoping to get uh, quite a number of other clubs. We are using a number of other uh, resources to try and uh, get the word out. And uh, we do hope that uh, we'll have a, a lot of uh, results from that work. Um, so the, uh, the other things that uh, I was going to mention is that uh, one of the problems we'll, we'll need to overcome is, is regularly having these meetings and making a commitment to make them work. We hope that works. We're, AWB will assist in getting the meetings started, uh, getting the engagement going, and, and after that, obviously, if we have very, very many clubs meeting, we won't be able to do, we won't be able to attend all those meetings, but certainly want to get them started and get the engagement going. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it. And most of the clubs we talk to uh, on both sides, the U.S., North American clubs, and the international clubs are very excited about this. Yeah. So, so we do, do have it works. Yeah. So I think you have, uh, and, and I mentioned that uh, Marus Club in Lahore is particularly well equipped, uh, very active. And you notice that they say that in addition to the other usual things, school programs and public outreach, they do go out to dark skies once or twice a year, which is kind of backwards from what uh, astronomy has been traditionally in the U.S., where dark sky observing is more common and we're having more public outreach being done now as a secondary program. But that, that's what I find is most common around the world is doing public outreach and and dealing with schools. And uh, Leo, you have one more club to show us a few pictures about here that uh, is doing quite a bit of that. Yes, this club is uh, in eastern India. 
Um, and I lost my note on the name of the club. Um, if you uh, have Miseram. it there, Mike. Miseram. Yeah. And it's interesting that uh, it's really way out east in, in India. And I thought I knew my geography pretty well, but uh, this is over near Bangladesh and uh, Miramar, and it's sandwiched in there. Uh, very interesting area. Um, a lot of uh, forestation in the area, and one of the areas that's growing a lot of uh, bamboo, uh, and it's expanding that industry. But mm -hmm. uh, that club, uh, as I remember, I don't have my note again, but I think that club has a large number of members as well. And you can see from some of the other photographs that uh, they do have some outreach programs where they're doing observing. Uh, number, I think the photo number two or three shows some of that. Yeah, photo and, number uh, two there is uh, <coughs> showing a lot of outreach. And this is, this is a little more typical uh, with more basic types of telescopes. And uh, this is a very, like you said, a very remote area of India. So those are geography uh, nuts like, some, like Leo and I apparently are. This is a, kind of a little piece of India that wraps around Bangladesh and is, is very much removed from it. So and you can see even from the people that look more Southeast Asian. So this is a very interesting place. And you can also notice that uh, the demographics in that photograph are very young people. Uh, you know, so that the, the outreach is in retaining those people on astronomy and science. Uh, the opportunities are there. All we have to do is reach out to them and keep them involved. And uh, I think we'll all be better for it. Uh, I think the and, next photo also uh, shows uh, some of the young people around one of the telescopes. And th these are really more, much more typical scenes from around the world that I'm, I'm used to seeing uh, in terms of equipment and the, the people involved and, of course, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a very exciting program. Uh, we encourage you to look at the website and uh, become aware of what's going on. If you do have a club, that might be interested in pairing, uh, make an application online. We'll get in contact with you, and we'll let you know what clubs are available to be paired with, and uh, we can get something going, and it would be very exciting. And we hope it will work for everybody. So uh, we, I don't know if it's on the front page of the website yet. Uh, when we come back to Andrew, maybe he'll be able to tell us, but we are going to, this has been a little bit hidden because we didn't want to be inundated with too many clubs, but this is on the website, and uh, we will be having more links and uh, information about it sort of more public and out, out front here very soon. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Night Sky Network of uh, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, who is helping us to reach uh, the four or five hundred clubs that they have in their network as well, which is a great partnership. Yep. Very good. Well, thanks, Mike, for inviting me in here this morning. I hope this program will will grow, and uh, we uh, we certainly we're going we're going to continue to support it, and uh, we look forward to uh, talking to other clubs. Yeah, and, and Leo, I'm sorry if I missed it. Did you uh, mention some of the other countries that we have uh, involved? Oh right yeah, we have, we have we have Pakistan, Sri Lanka. I think there's now. I think we have five clubs from India. We have a club in Vietnam, uh, a, a couple clubs in in the African continent. We have Tanzania, uh, Uganda. Um, let's see, uh, Tunisia. Um, what else have I lost? I forgot. But uh, they're, they're virtually uh, all over. And these are some very interesting places as well. Uh, so uh, this will be a, a good education for some of the U.S. clubs to see what's going on in other countries there as well. So that's, that's terrific. So if you are following us on Twitter, uh, we just had a tweet go out for the pairing program link. Uh, on our front page, so go ahead and check that out. Uh, if if not, you'll find it on our website as well. So those U.S. clubs in particular who are interested in doing the um, these uh, this program pairing up with somebody, I guarantee you it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a lot of fun. Just let us know. So thank you very much, Leo, for describing that for us. We've we, this has been a hidden gem, and I'm glad it's out in the open now. Well, thank, uh, thank, we, thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you for getting me engaged and look forward to continuing to do this. Absolutely. Okay. 
So <clears throat> we've got a few minutes left, and I'd like to come back to Andrew Fazekas, also known as Night Sky Guy, on his blog. He's a uh, journalist who writes for not only his own blog, but for National Geographic, uh, Canadian uh, news uh, outlets I know of, of, of some kind, and many others. So uh, I can't rattle them all off for you, Andrew, but Andrew is, in addition to, to wearing one, uh, one of his hats being an AWB hat as our communications manager, uh, he's very involved in uh, astronomy and science issues of, of all kinds. And uh, we wanted to talk at least briefly about a new program, again, a grassroots program that is very interesting and uh, it's the kind of thing that we want to let everybody know about and get involved as much as we can. And this is called uh, Beam Me to Mars. It's, it's created by the Wingu uh, organization who has done a number of programs like this. And the purpose of Uwingu is to y utilize crowdfunding and crowdsourcing to develop uh, funding for not, not only planetary ex exploration itself, but also organizations to outreach on it. All of it leads to the same thing. All of it is good stuff. And, and uh, by way of disclaimer, Astronomers Without Borders is one of the grantees of UINGU. But we support what they do. In addition, it's not just about the money. Money helps, but this is a great program. So we want to talk about it and get people involved. And uh, Andrew, do you want to describe it a little bit? Oops, mute, mute, mute. Right. There we go. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Ah, me excellent. Me. Yeah, so this is a very interesting program because, um, like you said, it's crowdsourcing. Uh, it's citizen science in a sense. Um, and it's fun. It's, I think it's a fun way to engage people, you know, the, 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 the people that, and people, by the way, have a fascination with Mars that goes back generations here. And so what we're talking about here is uh, using a collection of radio antenna, radio antennae, to beam a message on November 28th to the planet Mars. And this is a chance for anyone, really, to come on board, uh, write some verse, write some personal note, even send uh, a, a photo, if you like, uh, and send it to Mars. Now, of course, there's, uh, there's a cost attached to it. And the whole idea here is that the, f the money that's garnered from this campaign, half of it will go into, actually, the cost of doing this transmission to Mars. And after all, we're talking something on the order of 170 million miles that Mars is from, from Earth right now. Uh, and to do this transmission, half of the funds goes to that, and the other half actually goes into the Uingu, um Fund. Uh, it's a grant for research, funding research and education programs that Uingo offers. And uh, already there's been stuff that Uingo has done before with other cam similar crowdsourcing campaigns where that it is really going down to graduate students, allowing them to uh, fund them, for instance, for going to do presentations at conferences, sh uh, sharing the science that's being done. And there's other good work that Uingo is doing that's similar to that in terms of education and research. Because after all, uh, in, in today's economic climate, uh, the, you know, scientists have been hit hard, particularly astronomy and space exploration. Uh, and so this is really good work that Uingo is doing, trying to, trying to get the buzz out there with people, getting people engaged in space exploration. And this, by the way, is going on the 50th anniversary of the of Mariner 4 mission, which happened on November 28, 1964, when we got our first close-up images of another world, in this case, the red planet. And we saw deserts and craters and all kinds of interesting things for the first time uh, from a spacecraft. Yeah, and it, in, in fact, I, and I remember this one. You're a little young for that, Andrew, but uh, I remember it, and we were all waiting to see, are there really canals on Mars or not? Not that we expected they were built by an advanced civilization, <laughs> but nobody really knew. And I know, you know new Mars observers who said, yeah, you can definitely see them, but what they are, nobody knows. And it turns out 
they aren't really there. It's an observing effect. It's essentially our brains processing it. But this was a really big thing to see close up on Mars for the first time and see, well, those canals aren't really there. What's going on? I mean, it's hard to imagine now with, now that we have 3D maps of the moons of Saturn and things like this, it's, it's hard to imagine that uh, just 50 years ago, uh, we never had a close-up look at anything other than uh, the Earth, and at that point too, we hadn't landed on the Moon yet, but we were we had uh, uh, robotic uh, spacecraft, the unmanned spacecraft, uh, giving us a close-up look. So and it's and amazing. It, it's amazing that even today's generation is fascinated. I mean, look at the efforts. We're talking today still about Mars. You you can hardly go a week. In the, looking at the news without something about Mars popping up, you know, talking about life, the, the opportunity there for go, sending uh, humans there. So we're still working on that, apparently. So uh, it, it's amazing the, 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 the real hold that the red planet has on us. Yeah, it, absolutely, and it always has. Like you say, going back to Edgar Rice Burroughs, he didn't just write about Tarzan, but he wrote about <laughs> uh, somebody on Mars. and. Uh, Heinlein and and you know all the greats as well as speculation about it and it, one would have thought that in 1964 when we looked at it and, you know and again it's hard to believe that that recently people thought so a lot of people still had a reasonable argument that there was some sort of uh, uh, civilization I mean that that had kind of been blown away with big telescopes but it, this really w was a big moment and but we're still looking for life there. And now it's amazing, you know. Planet. It is amazing, Mike. I, I have to, t I have to tell you, just like my planet, I've always been fascinated with Mars. And look, I just show you something, just so something that you, I'm sure people out there might re recognize. I've got here an image here, uh, an actual um, painting by bon Chesley Bonstell of Mars yeah. that he did uh, in the er mid 1950s. And this was a classic view of what Mars was. It's a, a desert, but it was interesting if you look at the the actual. Uh, the uh, the sky they thought it was blue, right? Right, so right, right. It, it's very interesting where how far we've come, but yet some t in some sense we've come full circle in terms of our knowledge about about Mars. It's it, it and and the fascination is still there, which is amazing, and that's why I think this Uingu project is kind of cool because it's it's really connecting people with something that's literally fifteen light minutes from Earth. You know, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Think about, even at the speed of light. Almost as close as you get, though, in terms of the universe. And I think you hit it, too, with the buzz. This is really about awareness. The, the money will, will do a good thing, but it's bigger than that because there are a lot of efforts right now, people talking about and promoting going to Mars, manned expl uh, exploration or person exploration to Mars, men and women, and uh, actually landing on the red planet and exploring it directly. And this has been in discussion for decades as the next step after the moon. We've sort of pulled back from manned exploration back into a low Earth orbit and haven't gone back to the moon in a long time. But this is a natural next step. And I know that the planetary sciences, Uingo is, is created by and run by planetary scientists who really have a passion for this. And uh, they, they want to see these things happen. So this is about awareness. And uh, to help with that awareness, there have been some really uh, stellar, so to speak, uh, individuals who have sent their messages, including George Takei, uh, Mr. Sulu on Star Trek, later Commander Sulu, as uh, us Trekkies know, <coughs> and uh, Babak Ferdosi, otherwise known as the Mohawk Guy, uh, one of the uh, Curiosity uh, staff at JPL, uh, who, who uh, gained fame with his hairdo, uh, hairstyle during the Curiosity landing. Um, who are some of the others? Uh, I know there have been some others. I can't. Yeah, there. Well, let, for for me as a Canadian, proud uh, to say that uh, Chris Hatfield is also involved, yeah. the former commander on the International Space Station and media star now. Uh, Chris Hadfield uh, also sent his message, and uh, there's been others like Bill Nye, the Science Guy, also yeah. got has has gotten in on it as well. And I'll mention that Bill Nye is the executive director of the Planetary Society right now, and they are the longest uh, lasting and the largest space advocacy program 
on this planet, and they are behind it as well. And if you look at the um, Beam Me to Mars page, you'll see Astronomers Without Borders listed there, right up on top because it's in alphabetical order, but uh, the Planetary Society as well. And I'll mention that this came up fairly quickly, so I was trying to get some people from the Planetary Society to join us to talk about this and about the funding and the importance and advocacy. And everybody was interested, but nobody could make it on short notice like that. So next next month, we plan to have a larger segment about this and what it really means and to promote this, but really talk about space exploration and how people on Earth can take part in that and be a part of the solution in getting us out there, because this is a great program for everybody to take part. So uh, now, uh, at some point, if he hasn't already, Liam will show us the Beam Me to Mars slide here, the date that these will be beamed out there, and how you can find this program on the Uingo page. And I will say, too, that Andrew, you know, you're the communications guy, and mostly you communicate our message about Astronomers Without Borders to Earth, but we've got to talk about sending... Uh, I think it would be good to send the AWB logo to Mars along with all the others here. I think that would be very appropriate. Yeah, let's, so. let's hit the cosmic roadway. Yeah, that's right. There we go. <laughs> so the astronomers without uh, interplanetary borders. Exactly. And the, the, the AWB logo has been to the moon and back. Uh, so uh, let's let's send it up there. And again, <laughs> this is really all about uh, awareness as much as anything else. Uh, showing support for it. This is a a big moment uh, when all the people of Earth have a chance to make a statement by saying, "Look, we're going to Mars. Government hasn't gotten us there. Private industry hasn't gotten there. We're going. We're doing this. Uh, sh showing the way." Sure thing, and, and Mike, I, I just wanted to mention that folks know that they can just head on to our front page, AWB's front page, astronomerswithoutborders.org, and right on the top there, uh, there's a, a slide presentation of our main news, and it's one of the top news right now. You can just click read more, and it'll be take you'll be taken straight to the campaign page if you to get some more information. All right. Well, that's great. This really is a good one, and it fits exactly with what uh, AWB is about. So I hope our community will take part in that, too. And uh, So thanks for joining us for that as well, Andrew. It's good to have your insight into it, and uh, we'll talk about what else we can do. I believe that there are more announcements to come about this program, and it depends on the participation of everybody. But I'm not going to use my inside information in order to throw something out there before you Ingo does. But uh, th this is a big one, and I think it's going to have an impact, and I think it's going to be a big message for those who have the ability to get us there to wake up and see what people want. So thanks for joining us again, Andrew, and for hanging on this long in order to come back again. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on this Hangout today. Despite the technical glitches, some of which our producer, Liam Kennedy, may uh, take out there. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Liam. Of course, he's behind the scenes, and he's hiding behind some pictures right now, or I might tell him to bring himself in. He'll do that if he wants to. Liam Kennedy of Image Beam, which is a company here in Southern California, that does uh, video production as well as uh, webcasting and Google Hangouts is a new thing. And there we see Lee Liam there. Hello, Liam. And because Hello. you're so gracious about helping us out with these things and it's so terrific and putting up with the technical problems of all this live stuff, I like to make sure that, that, that people recognize what it is you do for us. One of the many people who volunteers to help uh, Astronomers Without Borders, but we've known each other for a long time anyway. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be able to help. Thanks, Mike. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you, Liam. Thank you to Andrew, Leo, Maruf, and Kathleen for joining us. Thanks to everybody who took part, and especially those who were uh, watching. We hope that there will be quite a few more uh, views of this on YouTube. Uh, let people know about it, and we will let you know what the link is going to be as well. And I'm sorry we missed uh, my friend Sohail Salimi from... Uh, 
Iran, Sadat Char in Iran, had a question for Kathleen, but we missed it. So, Hale, we'll make sure that we get her uh, answer to that on one of the blogs or something like that. So thanks, thanks everyone for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you again next month. So that's it for Astronomers Without Borders monthly hangout for August. Clear skies and goodbye. <laughs>